Okay, summary. What do we have here? Uh, a stroke of genius, I think. It's a monetary system governed by a computer algorithm. It offers a potential of low-cost banking available to anyone in the world with a cell phone. Uh, it, it has a digital cash supply free of political manipulation. Sounds fantastic. Um, some of the drawbacks. Well, in Bitcoin in particular, as opposed to other protocols like Ripple, for example, in Bitcoin, the decentralized structure of the protocol implies a relatively slow processing speed. So you can wait something like 10 minutes to get your payment processed. Uh, I, I don't know what the technology, how it might evolve to speed that up, but you know, this, this process of communal record keeping, just, it's, it just, it's decentralized, so it, it takes time. Uh, and, you know, if you could appoint a, a somebody you trusted, they could do it right away. But this, you know, you know how hard it is to get consensus in a, in a committee. <laughs> That's basically what we have here. The other thing is, is that uh, you know, while this, the protocol is often uh, portrayed as something that does not require trust at any level, that's not quite true. What's true is the trust is located in some different parts. Right? It's true there's no central bank that you have to trust. You don't have to trust the Bank of America, that's true, but you do have to trust other things. You have to trust, do you trust the code, the source code, how it's written? Do you trust the programmers? Do you trust the miners? Do you trust Satoshi Nakamoto isn't out there who has a switch who's just going to like suddenly double the supply of bitcoins? I mean, I don't know. How big is it? Currently about 7 billion, oops, 7 billion in bitcoins are in circulation. That sounds like a lot, but if you compare it to US dollars, there's about 1.2 trillion US dollars in circulation. So bitcoin is still kind of small relative to US dollars. Um, there's about 40 transactions per minute. How does that compare with, say, Visa? And Visa processes, on average, something like 200,000 transactions per minute. The average transaction size uh, in Bitcoin transactions is about $2,000. In Visa, it's about $80. So what we have here is relatively few transactions. They're relatively large transaction sizes. So it's still small potatoes relative to what's out there, but of course, the, uh, the exciting thing, you know, is the potential for growth. It's been growing ra rapidly. Okay, let me talk a bit about, uh, you know, what, what has everybody's, uh, um, what everybody's talking about here is the price of Bitcoin, right? For, for many years, it's like trading for close to zero. Uh, many years since 09, I guess, you see the, why am I pointing there? I should be pointing here. Uh, and then we saw the price skyrocket, right? People were amazed at this price appreciation here. It, then it crashed and it kind of averaged about a hundred bucks for a while. And then, you know, it suddenly over the course of a very short period of time, it just skyrocketed, right? 10 times, tenfold increase more. Um, I guess it came tumbling down. Was this the Mount Gox episode? Is that uh, what was happening? Some sort of issues with Mount Gox and, uh, or was that earlier? I, I can't remember now. China. Oh, is that China? Yeah. And then uh, more recently, the IRS ruling, which I'll, I'll touch upon these things. But you know, what's, the, what's, what's striking is the, the rapid price growth and the volatility since then. Okay, um, is Bitcoin a bubble? It kind of depends on what you mean by bubble. Now, bubble is one of those words that you have to use carefully. I mean, it kind of means different things to different people. So I'm going to define it in a particular way. I'm going to define a bubble as basically a, a what is known in the literature as a liquidity premium. And if we define bubble in that way, then the answer is yes. And if you think about uh, decomposing the market price of any security into two components, uh, some measure of its intrinsic or fundamental value. Uh, and uh, if you take a look at the difference between the market price if it's trading above its intrinsic value, we ascribe the difference, uh, we could ascribe the difference to a liquidity premium. That is to say, you know, most assets are, uh, are valued not only for their intrinsic use, but how easily they can be uh, liquidated, how easily they can be passed along in, in future transactions. So by this definition, yeah, I mean, uh, Bitcoin has a positive market price. Uh, its intrinsic value is zero, and therefore, uh, its entire market value must be a bubble. I mean, it's the only reason people value Bitcoin is because they view it as a liquid instrument. They, they, they believe that somebody else will accept it in exchange down the future road, right? 
Most assets, like I say, they'll have this property, at least a, a bit of a liquidity premium, even gold, right? Even though gold might have some positive intrinsic value, if it was to circulate quite widely, the market value of gold would likely exceed its fundamental value, and that would reflect its uh, value in facilitating exchanges. Is Bitcoin a good investment? Hmm. Wouldn't you like to know that? I think I'll skip this slide. <laughs> Warning, we have very good economic theory that tells us that asset price changes are difficult to forecast. <laughs> a lot of people have lost a lot of money not listening to this theory. You know, the, the, what, how do you forecast these things? I mean, it's, I'm amazed. I don't know. It kind of depends on like uh, your outlook uh, for any new product, right? Um, how rapidly and extensively will it penetrate the market? Well, geez, I don't know, I got some idea, but uh, hmm. Uh, how might government regulations evolve over time? Oh, great. Now you want me to predict our government. Uh, oh, not only our government, but also the Chinese and the Russians. I mean, how are you gonna predict this stuff? It's crazy. Uh, how easy is it to replicate the product? What did I just say? Bitcoin is an open source software. It's out there for all of us to, to we it's free. What's to stop somebody from just creating Bitcoin 2 and Bitcoin 3 or Bitcoin 4? I mean, it's, it's just out there, okay? You know, presumably Bitcoin has some first mover advantage, but you know, a lot of companies have had first mover advantages and have lost them over time. Um, and also importantly, what sort of competing products might emerge now and in the future? I mean, very hard to uh, predict. So yeah, good investment, I don't know, be careful, be careful. Maybe it might have some part in a diversified portfolio of investments. Just don't go crazy, don't go putting all your eggs in one basket. Have to say a little bit about Bitcoin and the failure of Mt. Gox. What was Mt. Gox? I don't know, maybe you saw that on the news, I think a lot of people did. Mt. Gox, as far as I understand, and somebody can correct me during the Q&A if I'm wrong, it was basically, uh, you know, think about when you go to the airport, you see these uh, foreign exchange kiosks that just put a Mt. Gox label, that's, that's Mt. Gox, except they live, these exchanges live all over the world. So they're places where you can trade your Bitcoin for different currencies, dollars, yen, euros, things like that. Um, except that, with an important difference, uh, I guess these, uh, these exchange centers also offered wallet services, which is to say they uh, permitted you to, uh, to hold accounts there that they would look after except that these accounts are not insured and you have to trust the uh, intermediary to, 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 to manage your wallet service. And my understanding is that what happened was these wallets were basically stolen. I mean, it was just a good old fashioned bank heist. Okay, so as far as I know, the Bitcoin protocol was not the issue here. I mean, there's people were, some people were blaming Bitcoin for this, but that's kind of like blaming the Federal Reserve for printing paper notes that are stolen by that little local bank across the street. I mean, it was just a good old fashioned bank heist. So be careful where you put your money in general, whether it's Bitcoin or whatever. Well, I, I asked the question, you know, is Bitcoin a good investment? Well, I mean, I don't know, but uh, I feel a little more confident in asking this question, answering this question is, is Bitcoin a good money? Um, you know, well, it kind of depends on what you mean by what constitutes a good money. Uh, among other things, I think a good money should maintain a stable purchasing power over short periods of time, okay? Price level stability depends both on money supply and money demand. Advocates of Bitcoin, and for that matter, advocates for a gold standard, want a rigid supply of money. And it's clear what's motivating that. It's legitimate. What they want is a supply of money that's free of political manipulation. Sure. But there's, there's cost to that policy. And the, the cost is that you're neglecting the demand volatility. You know, you got a fixed supply and you got a, a demand for money that could potentially uh, behave very, very violently. And indeed, money demand, we know, can fluctuate violently in the short run. I mean, all you have to do is go and take a look at the Bitcoin price chart. 
I mean, the supply of Bitcoin is not changing when you saw those price fluctuations. What that was was just the demand for the stuff was, was gyrating wildly. That also happens in times of financial crisis, crises like the one that we recently experienced. What did we see during the last financial crisis? We saw a flight to quality instruments like the US dollar and US treasuries, right? These were deflationary episodes. The demand for money in treasuries went up, interest rates and yields plummeted. We had a moderate uh, deflation during that period. To combat this type of demand volatility, wouldn't it be nice, at least in principle, if we could trust the stewards of this money supply, like the Fed, if we could permit them to supply additional cash when the demand was very high, to kind of stabilize the purchasing power of the object. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that, right? You can't do that with Bitcoin, or with, unless you, I guess, unless you program it, but I mean, you can't do that with gold. These are things that are in relatively fixed supply in the short run. I've got a plot here of the purchasing power of currencies since 1990. I've got four currencies here. I've normalized the purchasing power to 100 in 1990, and I've plotted the yen, the euro, the US dollar, and the Zimbabwean dollar. Take a look at this, this bottom chart here. This is the purchasing power of the Zimbabwean dollar. And as you can see, the purchasing power just plummeted. It's basically went down to zero. Right? That was the, the famous Zimbabwean hyperinflation under Robert Mugabe. At the opposite extreme, we have Japan. We see the purchasing power of the yen since 1990 has remained more or less stable. And indeed, uh, since about uh, 2000, the purchasing power of the yen has basically been rising modestly. So there's even been a moderate deflation in Japan. Not very much, but it's basically flat. And then in between, we see the experience of the euro in green and the US dollar in blue. What we see here is the manifestation of uh, roughly a 2% inflation target. Right? The Fed and the ECB say, you know, we, we're basically targeting 2% depreciation in the purchasing power of our currency. We're, we're, we, we have adopted that as an ex that's our, how we define price stability. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to be an advocate of you know, whether this line is better than this line. The striking thing about those lines, in my view, is that they're relatively stable. They don't exhibit wild fluctuations. So you know, sure, sure, there's a 2% inflation in, in the United States, but it's kind of forecastable. You know, it's kind of something you can predict, you can kind of bet on. It's something that the Fed is trying to manage something to help you manage when you write contracts and stuff like that to coordinate on kind of a 2% depreciation in the purchasing power of the currency. I mean, whether it should be a 1% inflation target or zero, I mean, that's something we can debate. But now, let's look at a shorter sample period. Uh, you know, how does the purchasing power of the US dollar hold up on the short run relative to, let's say, Bitcoin? Well, here we see, uh, I've normalized the purchasing power of the US dollar and Bitcoin to 100 in November of 2013. And you see the purchasing power of the US dollar over that short period of time hardly changed at all, right? I mean, there's hardly any inflation. I take a look at uh, the volatility and the purchasing power of Bitcoin. Now, you know, can you imagine, I mean, I don't know, uh, you go to work, you earn your Bitcoin, and the next day you want to go buy some bread and the purchasing power of your Bitcoin just plummets by 50%. I mean, that would be kind of annoying. Uh, or, you know, the other side, you know, suppose you got your Bitcoin and uh, you go and you spend it and, you, and you, you, buy, uh, you, know, you buy a piece of bread and the next day the price of the Bitcoin like doubles. I mean, it's like, you go, Jesus. <laughs> it's like, God, that's annoying. You don't want that in a monetary instrument. Uh, just for good measure, I thought I'd plot gold here for the gold bugs in the audience. I've normalized the purchasing power of gold to 100 uh, from two years ago, January of 2012. And you see the purchasing power of gold, it doesn't fluctuate as much as Bitcoin, but it is volatile. Uh, the purchasing power of the US dollar, you can see, you can see a moderate depreciation. You see how it's going down, it's going down a little bit. But take a look at gold. Right, it pops up, it goes down, and now it's higher. And then over the last year and a bit, it's basically lost 30% in its value. I don't know. What the heck does this mean? Nominal exchange rate indeterminacy. 
I think it's going to be something that people will be talking about. And you are the first to hear about it. So let's see if this pans out. That's my first prediction of the evening. The question is, what determines the market exchange rate between two intrinsically useless objects? <laughs> Take these poker chips, for example. Take the blue one and the red one. Can you imagine, you go to a casino, these poker chips are circulating in the casino. I mean, the casino owner says, hey, laissez-faire, man. Let the market decide. Let the, casino, let the participants determine the exchange rate of the chips, see what happens. What happens? What, what economic theory would you bring to bear that would fundamentally pin down the exchange rate of a blue chip and a red chip? Theory says there's nothing. The, the exchange rate can fluctuate for purely psychological reasons. It's perfectly, I mean, there's nothing fundamental, okay? Economics is very bad at explaining how prices are determined between two useless objects. We're very good at explaining what determines the relative price of oranges and apples. These are intrinsically useless, useful goods. But two intrinsically uh, useless objects, there's nothing in economic theory that really pins down the relative price. Consider two more intrinsically useless objects. They're identical in every respect. Forget the numbers for the moment. One has a picture of uh, Washington. One has a picture of Lincoln. Imagine these intrinsically useless notes are circulating in the community. And suppose you believe in laissez-faire. And tell me, what sort of theory do you have that tells me what will determine the exchange rate between Lincoln and Washington? I mean, nothing really. Uh, in reality, the exchange rate is 5 to 1. There's a fixed exchange rate system that's basically uh, stipulated and enforced by the Fed. People seem to be okay with these types of fixed exchange rate systems. When the casino sets the exchange rate between different poker chips, that seems to be fine. When we have a common currency area and the Fed sets the exchange rate between the, these notes, people seem to be fine. Um, but you know, now I want you to imagine a world with multiple unregulated, intrinsically worthless virtual currencies out there. Here I've got an example, a Bitcoin note and a Litecoin note, right? What are the fundamental economic forces that determine the exchange rate between these competing currencies? The evidence is that exchange rates of fiat currencies are excessively volatile. And as I just alluded to, the problem is that there's no fundamental economic force that pins down the relative price of two intrinsically worthless objects. And so this explains why fixed exchange rate regimes and common currency areas are so popular. What would happen in a world of multiple unregulated competing digital currencies? I think the outcome would be, you know, this, what we've seen in history with traditional fiat currencies. We'd see excess exchange rate volatility. I mean, you know, you'd be a merchant and what? You'd have to have about 100 different wallets. You'd have to like uh, diversify, you hedge your currency risk by maintaining 100 different wallets of all these different currencies, possibly. There might be some way to, to manage it better, but uh, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm not saying, I'm not passing any value judgment. I'm just saying this is an issue that I haven't seen talked about very much and I think that it deserves to be talked about. What is likely to happen? <clears throat> 